of the Mumei Education DBS. 要不要我说中文？<笑>我们今天是古维教育论坛第二期。那么，呃、uh, ，allow me to introduce our experts of the lecture. Uh, Dr. Robert Shaw from Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. Uh, Dr. Robert Shaw, he is from Guangdong University of Foreign Studies, International Student Exchange Program. When I saw Dr. Shaw's profile, 30 pages are really frightened me. <laughs> and but I'm not going to tell you the details about Dr. Robert. Uh, Robert 呢，他的那个简介有十三页纸那么长，所以的话呢，它里面包括他那个著作，他现在做的一些 project， 还有很多那个他的曾经那个教过的一些学院在新西兰和澳洲，呃，所以的话呢，那个详细的我就不说，待会他会告诉你啊。So, um, Dr. Shaw is going to talk about teaching children theory and practice. 他今天的这个讲课的内容，呃，我已经发到那个呃通知上面了。待会儿你们听一下，到底我们 doctor 他说的是什么？呃，我们今天要学习的内容是什么？有可能会提问的。And、uh, welcome, Doctor Shaw, to talk about our lectures. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, how do we get that done? Yeah. Thank you. Well, it's great to be here with you. Uh, let, let, me, let me just introduce myself first of all, say a few things about me, uh, and then we can get on to the, the topic. Uh, as you possibly have heard, I come from New Zealand, from New Zealand. And if you, if you know where New Zealand is, it's just to the right of Australia and down a bit. It's a little country. And uh, at the moment, I, I'm living in Guangzhou, and I teach at the Guangdong University of Foreign Studies. And I, so now I'm living in quite a big city. But you know that the metro system that they've got in Guangdong, the metro system, they put more people through the metro every day than is the total population of my country. So more people go on the metro every day than go than is the total population of my country. So my country is fairly small, fairly small, and we, we don't have big cities like in China. And the little town that I come from in New Zealand, that town only has about a thousand people. So it's a little town of a thousand people. So you can go into town and you can see nobody, virtually, nobody on the streets. So it's really different from living in Guangzhou. And I used to, uh, I used to be involved in teacher education. Uh, I've taught in universities, in schools of education. And, and what we did was trained teachers, trained teachers. And the ones that I trained, mainly primary school teachers uh, and some secondary school teachers. We don't have a middle school like you do, no middle school. So I trained mainly primary school teachers and some secondary school teachers. And I did that in Australia, uh, in Perth, in West Australia, and, and also in Queensland. Uh, a place called Toowoomba, which is a sort of education area. So, uh, yeah, most of my students uh, looked like you as teachers, but most of them were a little bit younger <laughs> because they were just starting out. And uh, so, so that's, that's where, where I began. So I, I like teaching and I like teacher education. Uh, I much prefer to teach teacher education. What I end up teaching um, these days uh, is mainly business subjects, mainly management and things like that. Uh, so I don't teach as much uh, to teachers as I can. I can tell you something about uh, teacher education. I can see it here. When I look around the, the room, do you notice that most of the people in the room are women? 
most of them are women. There's a couple of guys at the back. I don't know how you guys got in. Did you sneak in? <laughs> a couple of guys at the back, and the cameraman's a guy, and one over there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so we've got a very few, few men. So mainly, when you're thinking of primary school education, it's women. Oh, hang on, there's another guy there. Hi. Well, all the men put up a hand. All the men put up your hand. One, two, three, four, five. Good, good. Any more? Me, six. Did I count you? One, two, three, four, five, and me, six. No others? Right, right, right. Okay, so you see, out of all these people, we've only got six men. Wow, I don't know what that tells you. Probably quite a lot. And you're just the English teachers, aren't you? Yes. So if, if we had all the other subjects here, we'd have more men? More men. So the, so the, the women are the smart ones. They're the ones that do English? Yes. Ah, you're the clever ones. Ah, I see how it works. I see how it works. I got a, a talk to give you today about education. And because I hadn't met you, I didn't know what you really want to talk about. So I've got a lot more stuff than we're going to be able to talk about. So we'll just talk about some of the things. And if you want to ask a question or say something as we're going, you just put up your hand and wave at me. All right? Can you do that? That's the way that you do it in the West. You've got something to say, you put up your hand. And then, and then after a while, when nobody asks you, you take your hand down and put it up again. So, uh, yeah, you put up your hand if you've got something to say. Oh, the men who teach up. You, you, so, so, say that in Chinese. Say that in Chinese. In Chinese. Uh, I, I guess she's right. I don't know. I, I only speak three words of Chinese, but I won't tell you what they are. Okay. I wanted to start with that slide. Um, and this came from the uh, Ministry of Education's website. And it's a part of the Teachers' Law of the People's Republic of China. I think it's Article 7. Article 7. And when I saw that there, I really liked it. I thought that was really good. Really good. Because what that says, teachers shall enjoy the following rights. And the first one, to conduct educational and teaching activities and to carry out reform and experiment in education and teaching. That is a very powerful statement. It's a strong statement. The bit that's really strong is that bit there where it says, carry out reform and experiment. Carry out reform and experiment in education. What does that mean for you? It means that the government of China has said to you, you're teaching, but you also should be able to try new things, to do new things, to experiment, to try and find new ways, to try and improve the way that you actually teach. That's a very good thing for a government to say. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. Very good. Because it means that you can say, if you do something in your classroom and it doesn't work, it's a disaster, it's hopeless, and other teachers might say to you, oh, what are you doing? Or parents might say to you, what are you doing? Or even sometimes the children might complain. But you can say, look, I'm carrying out reform and experiment. I'm trying new ways. And that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So I think you should just remember that because it makes it legitimate, legitimate for, for what you do. All right? And then nextly, to engage in scientific research and academic exchanges, join professional academic societies, and fully express their views and academic activities. In other words, if we're talking about teaching, you should be involved with organisations, you should have points of view, you should be able to argue them, to talk about them, to say what you want to say. 
And again, that's a very helpful thing. And of course, why did the government do this? It did it because the government believes that if you have the ability to develop things in your classroom and to think about them and to argue about them, if you've got that ability, then that's going to improve your teaching and it's going to strengthen China. So that's why they did that. And I think that's a very good move. So today, what I thought we'd talk about, just a little bit about how do you become a good teacher, uh, something about teaching and learning in the West. And then I've put in here some slides about some of the important sort of theory that, that, that makes up Western teaching, the theory of Western teaching. And, and that's in two parts. The first part is the sort of old traditional way and the person that represents that, the person that's the example is this one, William James. Okay, so he, he's the traditional person. And then, and that's it, the traditional teaching methods. And then for the new type of teaching, the new type of teaching, somebody whom I think many of you have heard of, John Dewey, the American, John Dewey, and modern educational practice. So we start with the idea of a good teacher and sort of general discussions about that. Then we'll go to teaching and learning in the West, then William James and the traditional methods, then John Dewey and the modern methods. Okay? So that, that, that's the plan. So how do you become a good teacher? Well, wouldn't we all like to know? I think that uh, in your teaching career, you're teaching in a certain way now. In five years' time, you'll be teaching in a different way. You're going to change. I hope you change. The question is, how do we get you to change, to be better? How are we going to do that? Right? And you've seen beginning teachers, some of you might just be quite new teachers, you've seen beginning teachers in their first year is possibly the hardest and then it gets a little bit easier. And then they get to a point where they can start thinking about improving things. So you're going to change. The question is, well, how are you going to change so as to become a good teacher? I'll just tell you a few sort of quick truths, as I've called them, about learning. Just, just some things that I need to say so that you know kind of what I think about a few things. First of all, the child or the student, when I, when I say student, I'm, meaning, I'm thinking of, of high school students and I'm thinking of, um, of university students, people like yourself really, uh, focus on their needs. So you, you should focus on the needs of the child. We talk a lot about teaching, but maybe we should talk more about learning, about learning, because if we're talking about learning, we're talking about the learner. That is to say, the person in the classroom or wherever that we're trying to help. So that rather than that. Second one is something particularly for, for university level, but also for you. As adults, we teach ourselves. You might think that you can come along here to a talk like this and I'm going to teach you. I'm not going to teach you anything, really. I really aren't. What I can do is that I can put a few ideas around. And if you want to do something with those ideas, if you want to, to, to benefit from those ideas, you're going to have to teach yourself. You're, you're going to have, is that better? You're, you're going to have to uh, learn yourself, to study yourself. Uh, once you get uh, into, say, university level and beyond, it's you that does it, or the, the learner who does it. It's not the teacher. It's not the teacher. The teacher can give you some stuff, but they don't really teach you much. Uh, and you've got to do it yourself. So the big decision you've got to make is, well, what sort of person do I want to be? Do I want to be a person who's going to learn and develop things? And if you do, you're going to have to do it yourself. Uh, just you. You. And, and fortunately for you, you can get things off the internet, lots of good things on the internet that you can get. And of course you can read books, and even better, you can start writing about things. Once you start writing about things, then your learning really will improve. 
So it's all over to you. I'll talk to you about a few things today, but anything that you're going to learn, you're going to have to do yourself. Third one, give the students the space in which to learn. Give them the space in which to learn. All the research, all the research that we've got about children's learning tells us that they learn best when they're given time, encouragement, a good environment, and not put under a lot of pressure. If you leave them alone, it's amazing how well they'll learn. But if you push, 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 then they won't learn so well. And yet, as a teacher, you think you're going to be doing roughly what I'm doing now. You think you're going to be standing here saying, oh, you know, whatever. well, no, that's not what you should be doing. You've got to try and take yourself out into the background. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. So the more you want your students to be creative, to, to be original and thinking, the more you've got to leave them alone. The more you've got to leave them alone. And number five, if you want your students to be responsible, give them a chance to practice responsibility. Now this is quite a big one in, in China particularly, right? I, I was amazed when I first came to China. I've been teaching in China now in universities for two years, two years. And when I came to China and I started teaching in my university, big difference from what happens in, in, in other universities. First of all, students come along and people check on whether they're there or not. They take the role, they tick their names. You're there, you're there, you're there, you're there. And the students, the monitor came up to me and said, look, yes, the role, can you sign that they're all there? And I thought about that for a moment and I said, no, I'm not going to sign. The monitor looks at me, he's not going to sign the role. <laughs> oh dear. And I said, no, no, look, I couldn't, I couldn't care less if the students come or if they don't come. That's not what it's here that I'm about. If they, if they think that it's valuable to come to class and to learn, good, great, we'll do our best for them. But if I say to them, look, I'm going to take the role and you're going to get marks for being here, can you see how that takes the responsibility away from the student? It's now me, the teacher, making the decision about whether they're going to be in class or not. I have decided you're going to be in class, we're going to take the role, we're going to check all your names, right? What I've done is that I've stopped the student from being responsible for themselves, for getting themselves to class and for learning in class. I've taken that off them. So what you get is that you get a lot of good students, they all come trotting off to class, they all get their names ticked, they all sit in class and they don't learn anything. Right? They don't learn anything, just there because they've got to be there. That's it. Well, that's no good. That's not going to help us. Give your, give your students more freedom in terms of what they do and what they don't do. And I'm thinking more of the university students and the little ones here. I'm talking about the university students. Give them freedom. And then what happens is, a number of things happen. One is some students find, look, it's a waste of time being in class. I can study this stuff and learn this stuff myself, or maybe with my friends, or maybe getting things off the internet, and I can learn it more effectively than I can by listening to the teacher. So they, they do that, and that's fine. That's fine. If they learn that way, that's how they learn. Of course, it still means they've got to sit the examination and pass. If they don't sit the examination and pass, well, oh dear, that's a bad thing. So, in other students, they say, oh, we don't have to go to class. So they miss a few classes. And then they hear the other ones talking about what happened in class, and then they start to get a bit worried. They think, oh, I could be missing out on something here. What's happening in class could be important for me. And so, trot, 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 off they go, they start coming to class. Now, as soon as they do that, when they come to class like that, it's them that's made the decision to be there. 
It's their decision to be there. Can you see how that's much stronger and better than you, the teacher, or the university or the school saying, you must be there? Right? Because it comes from them much better, much better. Okay, so that's what that fifth one is about. And I, I just put that slide in there just with a few sort of thoughts about, about my thinking about education so that you know where we're coming from. Well, here we are. I've got a question for you. Which one's the best teacher? Which one's the worst teacher? What do you think of them? What can you tell just by looking at those pictures? I'm going to ask you to say something about the picture, right? about one of those pictures. So, so if, if we, we'll just do it this way. We'll call that number one, we'll call that number two, we'll call that number three, we'll call that number four, we'll call that number five, and we'll call that number six. All right, so we've got six pictures. Now, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to come up and give you the microphone, and I'm going to ask you to say something about one of the pictures. Now I want you to say the number of the picture, one, two, three, four, or five, or six, and then say something about it. We'll make it easy first of all, you can say it in Chinese, okay? You can say it in Chinese. So think what you're going to say if I choose you, and then Having a big grin and a big smile is a good way to get chosen. <laughs> uh, the, uh, yeah, so you all got something to say? All right, all right, all right. I'll come up here and I'll choose somebody. Yeah. All right, you know what to say? One picture? I, I think I chose number six. That one? Yes. All right, what do you think about it? Uh, <coughs> the teacher give the child more. Uh, Say it in Chinese. Say it in Chinese. Uh, that teacher gave the that that child many of that energy in there. Then is, that is, that is, that is, that is, 是属于一种赏识教育 然后在教英语方面还是通过一种直接翻译的那个方法。Picture 他是通过什么方法去教授的我看的不是很清楚然后picture Put up a hand if you agree with what she said. Do you agree with what she said? Put up a hand if you agree with what she said. Put up a hand if you don't agree with what she said. Okay, hey, that's good. That's good. Do you, do you want to say something about it? Say it again. He wants to say something? That's what we like. You can see the men are the active ones, eh? The men want to say something. Come on.
Introduce yourself. Say your name. Uh, my name is uh, Ding Zhishen. I'm from Marshall Normal Middle School. Okay, uh, 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 I also uh, want to talk about picture six. Uh, I think she is the best teacher uh, because uh, uh, I think she loved her student and uh, uh, she and her student uh, have uh, they teach the student in uh, interreaction they can they practice with a student and uh, I think the worst teacher is teacher three yeah, right. because uh, she um, do something bad to a student yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, and that's all. <laughs> well, it's interesting. You said that um, this one loves her students. This one loves her students. But do you think the one up there, number three, do you think she loves them? Or does she think she doesn't love them? You can't really tell, can you? And the number three might love the students too. Right? She might love the students too. It's not a good idea to, to twist the ears of students. <laughs> right? A bad thing. <laughs> she could be punishing the student, yes. She could be, yeah. But does she care about the student? Does she care about the student? Does she love the student? She may be, yeah. You can't tell, can you? Yes, yes, yes. Maybe she's well intentioned. She she thinks something she, she doesn't know how to get to do it, but she's trying this way but she's trying to get the right result. Yeah, you can't tell, you can't tell. Maybe she needs to come to more teacher education classes like this. Maybe that's what she needs. Okay, look at number one and two. Number one and two. It's very common, isn't it? It's very common. Traditional way, traditional way, yeah. And, it, and, it, and it's more than just the traditional way, it's the way that most get taught today, isn't it? If you, if you wander around, well, I, I wander around the university, and you know when I walk down the, the corridor in the university and all the teachers are teaching, right? I, I poke my nose in the window just to see what's going on. Then I go to the next one and have a little look, you see, have a little look at what they're up to. PPT, that's what most of them have got. Reading, reading from the book, some of them, right? Reading from the PPT as I'm doing. That's what, that's what they're doing most of the time. Yeah. And that's what we've got to get away from, isn't it? Because that just, that, that doesn't get the student involved. Right? It's kind of easy for the student. The students sort of sit there and, and they don't have to do anything. Okay. So, number four, number four. Well, at least number four, She's got the boy doing something, hasn't she? The boy is actually up there doing something. And if it's a small class, well, they could all get to do that. If she's got 50 or 60 in the class, that could be a bit more difficult. Yeah? A bit more difficult. So, yeah, I mean, the thing about number six, you see that there? Was that done by the student or done by the teacher? Pupil or the student? Yeah, I think so too. That was done by the student. So that, that's really good, isn't it? That the student's done that, and then the teacher's focusing on what the, 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 the student did. It's 
is right. You did this, okay? Great, great. We'll talk a bit more about that uh, later on, about, about how you can improve that sort of thing. So you can learn quite a bit just by looking at the, the pictures of people teaching, at least I think you can. Anybody want to say anything? Anybody got a comment they want to make? Anybody want to ask a question? When I'm talking, you try and think of questions. Right? Try and think what I'm saying and then think of something else. Um, my question is, um, which picture do you prefer? The question is, which picture do I prefer? Well, I don't, you see, you'll have to tell me, if you're going to ask me the one which do I prefer, you're going to have to say for what reason or in what way. Alright? In what reason or what way? It's, you can't tell. You can't really tell. I mean, the gentleman in the middle there, this guy, this guy, I don't know what that says. I don't know what that says. But it might be that he's doing the right thing for that group of students. Right? For his students. I don't know. I mean, it, it might be. Um, I think these two are not so good. I, I think they represent something we don't want to do <laughs> at, at any time, anywhere, right? Any time, anywhere. I think that's interesting. I think that, 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 that raises a lot of interesting questions, right? A lot of interesting questions about how you discipline children, how you punish children. Right? There's a lot of stuff there, we won't go into that, but there's a lot of interesting questions. I think that's pretty common. That's pretty common. The students in, in my university, they talk about death by presentation. Because they have to do so many presentations, they get so tired of doing presentations all the time, they work up late night doing the presentation, then they come to class the next day and do their presentation. Sometimes by themselves and sometimes in groups. So they talk about death by presentation, which tells you something, that if you do too much of anything, it's not going to be good for students. You've got to chop and change things around. Uh, so that's got something going for it. But that one, I think, is good because of this, this being the student's work and, and the, the one-to-one. -one, right? but, but, okay, you see that. Where, what about the other 29 students? Where are they? Right? So where are the other 29 when that's going on? Uh, that, that's the sort of question that you've got to ask. I mean, you're, you're in a public school, I think most of you are in a public school system, and, and, and our responsibility, I say our, meaning you and me, is to educate China, the whole thing, right? A lot of students, heaps and heaps of students. So you've got you to think about your techniques in relation to teaching, say, one or two. You've got... Millions of others that are going to need attention. And in your class, you might well have, say, 30 students. If you spend all your day with one of them, what about the other 29? Always a question. Always a question. So, those are the thoughts. Now, has anybody got anything they want to say before we go on to the next slide? Don't be shy. Okay. I'm talking to you about what makes a good teacher. Let's talk about a few things about bad teachers. I called them the lazy or the poor teacher. The lazy or the poor teacher. Well, one of the things about the lazy and the poor teacher is they like what I call tips for teachers. They, like, they often like to come along to things and think, oh, if I can just hear the right little thing about it, it'll make all the difference. They think that people somewhere else have got a kind of secret. They kind of know something that's really important. And if you get that kind of idea, then you can go away and you can do it in your classroom. And wow, everything will be good. And, and, and you get lists of tips for teachers. Right? All sorts of lists. And they say, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. Line up the students. Don't let them go into class until the line is straight. Right. Get them all straight, and they go. All right. Another little tip for teachers for some students 
is do some sort of exercises with them, physical exercises before the students start. So you go into your class and you say, right, everybody stand up. All right, stand up straight and put your hands in the air. All right, the idea is that you, you bring the group of students together and you get them kind of looking at you, you get them sort of physically involved and then you say, right, sit down, we're starting. Okay? In, uh, in religious schools, in, in church schools in the West, um, they used to do the same sort of thing, not with physical exercise, but with saying a prayer, by saying a prayer. So they would say a prayer before they started, and that brings them all together. Now, you know, that's an idea. You can say a prayer, or you can do physical exercises at the start. I, I'd call those tips for teachers. Uh, you could try it out, see what happens. Uh, okay, easy, simple, but it's not going to make much difference to your teaching overall. Now, a lot of teachers still think that if they can find the right sort of tips, the right sort of ideas, they're going to be able to, um, to improve their teaching quite a lot. Another thing about the lazy or the poor teacher is they like to be in control. They like to be in control. They like to think that they are an authority in their class, right? This is the idea that the teacher knows and the student doesn't know. Right? The teacher knows, the student doesn't know, the teacher's the authority. So we've got that situation here. I'm standing in front of you, I'm supposed to know, and you're supposed to be learning from me. But the reality is that you know a heap more about teaching Chinese students than I do. You have to know more about teaching Chinese students than I do. I've never taught a Chinese primary school student, or a middle school student. So you must know more about this than I do. So I can put some ideas up there, but you're going to have to look at them and think of them against what you know. Right? Against what you know. So lazy teachers like to be in control. They like to come along and they say, right, PPT, here we go. Go through that. Okay? And the pupil just sits there. They may or may not learn, and they probably don't. Another thing about teachers, they repeat each, each year. There's an old joke, I don't know where you get this joke. It's always a problem for me telling Western jokes in China. They don't always work. But let, let me try the joke. You get to, you're in the staff room, right? With your, your, your colleagues in the staff room. And you're having a little celebration because somebody is leaving. They've been in the school for 10 years or 20 years or something, and the school principal gets up. And he says, I want to thank this person very much. It's a wonderful career that they've had. They've had 20 years' experience. And somebody down the back says, probably just whispers to the person next to him, they haven't had 20 years' experience. They've had one year's experience, and they've done it 20 times. Right? You, some of you get it? They haven't had 20 years experience, they've had one year's experience, but they did it 20 times. This is the change, this is the teacher that doesn't change what they do. Doesn't change what they do. And that's a big message for me to you today. I want you to change what you do. What they do with them. So, uh, just go back one, and then we'll talk about him. When I said tips for teachers up there, they look, the teacher looks for the silver bullet, the silver bullet. Now, what is the silver bullet? The teacher looks for the silver bullet. Have you heard this expression? The silver bullet. That, that's a, a mythological creature, right? An old European mythological creature. And it doesn't exist, of course, it's not real. But they talk about it and they worry about it. And they say there's only one way you can kill it. There's only one way you can kill it. 
If this creature comes along, you're, you've had it. You've got to watch out. The only way you, you, can, you can kill it is if you shoot it with a special bullet. And the bullet has to be made out of silver. Right? A silver bullet. So there's only one way you can kill it. Shoot it with the silver bullet. And the idea is that if you can get the silver bullet and you can use that, then you'll solve all your problems. Because the, the one shot will fix it. But it's got to be the silver bullet. In education, there are no silver bullets. There's no single one thing that anybody can say to you or any truth that you can come across or learn that's going to solve everything. Right? It's, education is much more complicated than that. There's no simple solution. It's always going to be a complicated solution. No simple solution. So the silver bullet, we can ask simple questions about education and about teaching, but they don't have simple answers. So my question, what is the best way to teach? Simple question, what's the best way to teach? It's not a simple question. It's a very, very difficult question. Right? There is no simple answer. So where do you get the answer for that question? What's the best way to teach? The answer comes from your teaching practice and the theory. The theory and the practice go together. You can't do one without the other. You can't teach without a theory, and the better your theory, the better your teaching. So we're going to come on to that in a moment. So teachers, some number two, teachers sometimes look for tips that will help them, but you cannot avoid thinking. Reality is you're going to have to do your own thinking about teaching. I can give you a few thoughts, try and set you off in a few directions, but you're going to have to do your thinking yourself. So what sort of teachers does China need? That's the question for us. What sort of teachers does China need? Somebody said to me the other day, oh, China, gosh, all those students, all they do is study, 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 and pass exams, and then they forget what they learned, and oh, gosh, we've got a big problem with the students. And I thought about it for a bit, and I said to them, actually, you haven't got a problem with the students. There's no student problem in China. There's a teacher problem in China. No student problem, teacher problem. Students will do what they're asked to do. And people also ask me quite often, they say, what's the difference between teaching?